Today we're going to continue our series on great Bible events and we're going to be in the book of Job. So if you want to turn to the book of Job, then you won't have to flip your pages later. But what I want to talk about this afternoon is when tragedy occurs. Sometimes bad things happen in life and sometimes we have to learn how to deal with it properly and respond to it correctly in the light of our, of our Christian faith and hope. You know, several years ago there was a singer named Kurt Cobain. I'm sure none of you listened to his music because it wasn't the most go godly Christian music, but this man, this Kurt Cobain, this singer, he killed himself with a shotgun because he was filled with such bitterness and anger. And you ask yourself, why would he do such a thing in his life? And he had seemed to us, you know, to society that he had everything. He had a great career. He had a dedicated fan base. He had all kinds of money. He had a supportive wife and a, and a beautiful young daughter. So why take your own life? But the answer to that question is a lot simpler than some might think. Kurt Cobain simply lived out his beliefs to their logical conclusion. Unfortunately for this man, Kurt Cobain, he believed that there was no God. And he believed there was no meaning or purpose to his life. And if there's no God and there's no meaning or purpose to your life, he was basically the center of his own universe and he was very bitter about it and there was nothing that he felt was worth sticking around for. He opposed everything. One time he was asked why he was moping around so much and he replied to that. He says, because I'm awake. This is just a very bitter man. Uh, he was in a spiritual battle, whether he knew it or not. But the problem was he was in this battle with no armor, no weapons, and no way out. Because he didn't know the Lord's Savior. He had a passion for nothing and he had a void in his heart that just couldn't be filled. Wouldn't be filled. So he decided he, he'd had enough. Now also other disasters we see in, in Asia. There was a killer tsunami. All of us here remember the tsunamis that came sweeping through and claimed over 155,000 lives. There were trees that were uprooted, telephone poles were snapped in half, homes were destroyed and washed away, people drowned. You know, one moment these were people on the beach enjoying their lives, enjoying their vacation. The next thing they knew, it was over. There was calamity. As if the gates of hell themselves had burst open and poured out upon these people. So it's, it's like they just stood around asking themselves, what just happened? You know, suffering wears many different masks in our lives. There's lost jobs, there's dissolved marriages, there's re rebellious children, diseases, pain and death. And everything that we thought we knew about life, God and faith sometimes seem to fade away when tragedy strikes our lives. We don't always stick close to what we already thought we knew. And sometimes when the dust settles, some questions start to flood in and, and doubts start to surface. We may ask, why God? Why me? What did I do that was so wrong to deserve this? And to make matters worse, sometimes we don't think we get the answers. God is answering us, but we don't always pay attention and listen to it. So we ask ourselves, then we continue to ask ourselves, where is God? And when we don't perceive the answers God gives us, sometimes we start to make up our own answers. And we come up to our own conclusions. And unfortunately, we're usually wrong when we do that. When we make our own conclusions about why things are happening to us in our lives and why we're facing certain trials, we usually get the picture wrong. We need to ask God why certain things are happening. Because only God knows exactly why these things are happening as they do and how they do. Now as we look and we introduce the book of Job, there's five major themes in the book of Job. Suffering, Satan's attack, God's goodness, pride and trust. Those are the five underlying themes of the book of Job. Now as you read the book of Job, you see through no fault of his own, Job loses his wealth, he loses his children, he loses his health, and Job's friends were convinced that he would brought all this on himself by his own actions. So basically, when you look at everything that's within this book, you, ask, you can ask the question, what was Job's greatest trial? But the thing that was hardest for Job, 
the thing that he struggled with the most, and, and when you read through this whole book, wasn't the things that he lost. It wasn't the bad health. It wasn't losing his wealth. It was not being able to understand why God allowed him to go through the suffering for no apparent reason. And that's the same kind of struggles that we can go through sometimes in our lives. Why is God allowing this to happen to me? So we want to look through the book of Job and we're going to find some answers to those questions. So let's take a look in the book of Job. I'm going to start in chapter 1 and I'm going to read the first 19 verses in the book of Job. It said there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. For you younger ones, eschewed is the same as avoids. So he avoided evil. He stayed away from it. And there were, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the <clears throat> Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep, and the servants, and consumed them, and I alone am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I alone am escaped alone to tell thee. You know, first, I want to start and tell you about this story in Job that many don't believe that this ever really happened. There's a lot of people that will try to tell you that this is it's just a fable, just a story. And the one reason they don't believe this is because all these traumatic events that came in Job's life came way too close together. They said they just would never really happen. Everybody losing, somebody losing everything all at once like that. So they don't believe that it could happen that way. So the question is, does anybody here disagree with that stance? I believe the Bible tells us what happened. And we are to read it as it happened. So I'm going to look at the Bible and I'm going to see what it says behind the scenes, what's going on here. First we see 
God and Satan bantering back and forth. Satan had attempted to drive a wedge between Job and God, just like he tries to do that between all of us in our lives. He wants to separate us from God. And Satan is going to attack us when we least expect it. And he's going to attack us where we love things the most. He's going to come after our deepest desires and loves in our life. And that's where he's going to attack us. Sometimes he attacks us by trickery. Sometimes he attacks us, like he does Job, through destruction. Now first I want you to understand that God is still, and God always will be God. And because of that, Satan needed permission to tempt Job. So we have to remember that Satan is limited to what God allows him to do. Satan himself is also under God's control. God can bind him up when he wants to bind him up, and God can loose him when he wants to let him loose. So the child of God has no reason to fear Satan's attacks. Because any attack from Satan is only by permission of God. He's allowed to tempt us by God's permissions, as we see here in the book of Job. But here's the trick. Here's the thing we have to remember. We are never going to be able to control how Satan attacks us, but what we can control is how we choose to respond to those attacks, because they will come. So the question isn't, will I face hurt? The question is, how will I face hurt? It's not our actions as much as our reactions that are important here when we look and study how we deal with tragedy in our lives. One thing the enemy of our soul desires is to make us believe that he doesn't exist. Satan doesn't want you to believe that he's real. He also doesn't want you to believe that God is real. But he wants both, of, he wants both sides of the coin. If you don't believe he's real, then he's, he's already won one side of the trickery. More easily for him to deceive you if you don't believe him to be real. But in if you, and once that's done, once he can get you to believe that, the rest of it's easy for him. Life can go on and we just think that we're smart. And everything good for us is because we're good and we're smart and we do the right things or, or we're in the right place at the right time. Or we like to think of ourselves as, as, boy, we're just lucky people. And Satan loves it when we think we're lucky. Because a lucky person isn't a thankful person. A blessed person is a thankful person. I don't have any luck in my life, but I sure have the blessings of God, and I'm thankful for them. Now, Satan, he has no control over a Christian life. We can look. If you turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 22. Here's another instance where Satan gets permission to go after somebody. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We see here that Satan had to ask permission. Satan desired to have him. He had to ask permission to tempt Peter. And of course, he was granted that permission to do the tempting. Satan has permission to tempt us, to try and test our faith. Now the question is, does Peter pass or fail this test? Initially, he fails the test. And how do we know that? Well, because Jesus even said so in this scripture. He says, when you are converted or when you are turned back, after you failed and you come back around, what's he told him to do? He says, he's letting Peter know there's a purpose in this trial. He said, you're going to face this trial and Satan's going to come after you. And I'm allowing him to tempt you because it's going to build some character in you, Peter. It's going to make you the person that you are. And he says, afterwards, once you're converted, at the end of verse 32, it said, strengthen thy brethren. So he says, by the fact, Peter, that you're going to go through this experience, you're going to gain something that you can use and you can help others to overcome. And he says, that's why I'm allowing it to happen. 
But Peter, be on, beware. And he says, the Lord says, I'm praying for you though, Peter. Because you're mine. You're mine, Peter. Now as we look at this beginning of, of Job, we see God saying to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Can you imagine God saying that in heaven about you? Can you imagine Satan coming up to Jesus and Jesus coming to him and said, Have you considered my servant Joe? Or have you considered my servant Mike? Or my servant Kalen? Or my servant Charlie? Have you considered my servant? You know, how would we feel if we knew our name was being mentioned and talked about in heaven? We might want to act a little more upright and do more for God if we knew that we were talked about in heaven that way. But just imagine. And we see that Job, he understands that he's blessed of God. Back in the, in the book of Job, we see in verses 20 and 22, his response to what happens to him. It says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So instead of asking the big three questions that a lot of us tend to ask when trials come our way, Job worshipped God. He didn't turn around and say, why is this happening to me? Where is God when I need Him? And when will all this suffering end? No, he turned around and he worshipped God. Now, is it wrong for us to ask questions in times of trial? No, it's, it's not wrong. You can see that in Matthew 26, 46, where it said, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even Jesus himself asked the question, why, in his time of trial. To, so to ask why, where, when, and how is not necessarily wrong, but what we should is formulate our questions in a proper manner. Instead of saying, where is God? We can say, how will you help me? Or how will this strengthen me and my relationship with you? Or how will you work this out for my good and your glory? These are the unselfish types of questions that we should ask in times of trials. You know, the royal palace in Tehran in Iran has one of the most beautiful entrances that there is in all the world. When this palace was planned and the architects were designing uh, how they wanted to build it, they sent off an order to Paris for a bunch of mirrors that were going to line the entrance. They wanted to cover all the walls. And when the mirrors finally arrived all up in their crates and they started to take the crates apart, all that came out was a whole bunch of broken pieces. Every single one of the mirrors had shattered during transport. Now they were simply going to throw away the mirrors and start over, but one man had a better idea. He said, let us make use of them the way they are. Let's take them and we'll fix them together and piece them together and put them up on the walls anyways. And the result was this enormous distortion and reflection and it sparkles with diamond-like rainbow colors all through this entryway. So what we see in these mirrors is they were broken to be made beautiful. And that's the hard part for us. Sometimes that's the way God treats us. God uses the broken pieces of our lives to make us something better. To make us something more beautiful in His eyes. Now we ask the question sometimes, how can losing a family, family member or being the victim of a violent crime or suffering some kind of disease, how can all this bring glory to God? Well, I don't really always know the answer to that question and neither do you because we're not God. We never will be. But I'm glad to know that He is, and I'm glad to know that He knows how He's going to gain the glory from that. Because Jesus took all of that mess, 
all the sufferings and pain in our life which are caused by the sin of this world, whether it be our own or somebody else's, He took that on Himself. And because of all that, He gets the glory. Now, Joni Erickson Tata, this is a young lady who lost her ability to walk when she was just a teenager. She dove into a pond and broke her neck. And she was asked one day, she said, what are you going to say to God when you see Him? And she said, I'm going to fold up my wheelchair, I'm going to hand it to Jesus, and say, thanks, I needed that. She found that it was exactly what she needed in her life. And to God be the glory for it. She gave God thanks for everything that she had, even though she lost her ability to walk. You know, when bad things happen to us that we can't explain, we have to be careful not to cross the line from sorrow to sin. It's okay to be sorrowful when bad things happen. It's okay to, to have grief, but we can't allow that grief to quench our faith in God or to quench the spirit that's in us. You know, sometimes we may follow bad advice of the world. The world would tell you, as Job's wife did, Job's wife said to curse God and die, as was Job's wife's advice to him when these bad things were happening. The world doesn't have good things to say to us. You know, Kurt Gobain did the same thing. He cursed God and he did die. You know, but we, can, we need to ignore all that chatter that the world throws at us and focus on God. You hear so many times in so many Christian circles, the question asked is, why do bad things happen to good people? But first of all, the first question you have to ask yourself is, who told you you were good? Did not the Bible tell us that there is none good? No, not one? God alone knows the reasons behind the sufferings we go through. He knows why we're going through what we go through. And sometimes we may never know, we may never understand the reasonings behind any specific trial. Until maybe one day when we sit beside Jesus' side and, he, and we can see it more clearly. But in spite of all the pain, in spite of all the loss, in spite of the suffering, in this story, Job never once gave up on God. Job's hope wasn't wrapped up in his children. It wasn't wrapped up in his wealth or his health or his wife. But Job, he knew his hope was in God always and forever. So Job endured to the end and he received the victory ultimately in this battle. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we become a child of the King. You know, God the Father promises all of His adopt adopted children, which we are, he promises us the same rights that He promised His only begotten Son because we are His adopted children. Now Jesus went to the cross to pay that debt, a debt that we owe. What makes us all, none of us good, was the debt that we owe. And Jesus paid that for us. That's a sin debt that we could never pay ourselves, but that was paid in full on the cross of Calvary. He won the victory over death in the grave. The victory's already been won. And He grants to all of us who will live and believe in Him, He grants us all eternal life. All of us are granted that right of resurrection through His death. And now God has ascended into heaven and He's sitting on the right hand of glory. And He's sitting there. It says He's forever making intercession for us. You know, like we, as this story started with Job and Satan bantering back and forth. You can just picture Satan coming to God and saying, look what this one's doing down there, God. But then Jesus is standing there beside him saying, it's okay, I've, I've, I've got him covered. Don't lay it to his charge. He's covered under my wing. He said he's forever making intercession for us. And those are the beautiful words for us to hear. The beautiful things for us to understand. And ultimately, what we should make our goal in life is to focus on what we can do for God and never give up on Him so that one day when we do stand before Him in the great judgment throne, we can hear that wonderful phrase, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Well, let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.